What's the worst that can happen when you're 20? You lose what you have. You're 20. You've got all your life ahead of you to restart something else. I mean, how exciting is that? Hey, friends, and welcome back to Deep Dive, the weekly podcast where every week it's my immense privilege to sit down with academics and authors and creators and entrepreneurs and other inspiring people, and we find out how they got to where they are and the strategies and tools we can learn from them to help us build a life that we love. What you're about to hear is an interview between me and Mark Tilbury. Now, Mark has an incredibly inspiring story. He left school at the age of 16 with no qualifications and no money. He then had a winding career trajectory and he took a couple of risks and ended up starting his first business. And now 30 years later, he is a multi-million dollar CEO. I always knew at 16 when I left school, I wanted to be self-employed. I'd done loads of different side hustles. I've always liked finding ways of making money. School teaches you to go out and find a job to earn money, but it doesn't teach you what to do with that once you've got it. In this conversation, we talk a lot about business, how to build a physical business, how to build an online business, what it really means to think like an entrepreneur and the skills needed to survive in the world of business and how to make this thing that we call passive income. Everyone who's young has got time to make money. I don't think people are aware of how much time they have. I'm probably going to shock you here with something. At the moment, according to the YouTube analytics, 81% of you who are watching this on YouTube have not yet hit the subscribe button. And so if you're, for example, in the now 81% of people who are watching this on YouTube, but who are not subscribed to the channel, I would love it if you could do so. And it would be awesome to get that number down to 50%. And it would be cool to get like 50-50 sub non-sub ratio, just, just for fun. Mark, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. You're it's going to be welcome. It's going to be super fun. I've been looking forward to this for a long, long time. <laughs> yeah, same. And yeah, I'm, I'm going on yours as well. So we'll do a link swap and all that all that jazz. Um, your story is, is super interesting. And I'd love it if you can just kind of take us take us through it. And then I'll and then we'll dive in at different points. And I'd, I'd love to ask more questions about it. So well, my, it's, it's yeah. quite a long story. It depends where you want me to start from, really. Yeah. Um, but obviously, I come from a different era to what is around now. Mm. Um, and I really wanted to leave school. School wasn't great for me. Um, I, I wouldn't say I hated it, but I didn't enjoy it. Is that fair enough? I tolerated going. Yeah. I had um, lessons that I enjoyed, like woodwork, technical drawing, sports, all that sort of thing. But everything else seemed to be a waste of my time. I always thought there was always more out there in the world for me to do. Um, so I thought 16, I can leave, so I will leave. Um, and I was told by my mentor at the time, although I didn't know he was my mentor then, that getting a trade will be your best bet. To, you know, whatever you want to do after that, get a trade behind you because you can't go wrong. So sure. I became a carpenter joiner and uh, did that apprenticeship for three and a half years. A carpenter joiner? Yeah. What is what, what is Well, that? like a cab- <laughs> like... The cabinet maker, you might okay. call it nowadays. Yeah. So I used to make, re- well, some nice furniture I used to make, but eventually I got wound up with the job because they got a really big contract for making these um, wooden trash bins for Walmart, or okay. Asda as it is in the UK. And I was constantly making these, and that's why I actually brought that job to an end because I thought, you know, I can't continue to do this. There's more to me than that. Um, and it actually pushed me out of that job, um, which was quite good, really, in hindsight. Um, but disappointing at the time. Do you, do you think that's still good advice for people today in 2023? Um, the trade I thing. I actually think personally, and I think we'll clash on this. Mm. Um, I actually think too many people go to university. Mm, interesting. Um, I think uh, I think it's about 25 percent at the moment. It's something like that. 20, yeah, it's quite high. 25%. Yeah. Um, and when I was at school, maybe 10 percent went. Um, So the best of the best went to university to do the jobs like becoming a doctor or medical professional like yourself, um, which you've got to do. I understand that, fully understand that, and that is correct. But what I think is a lost part of our generation now is the people that go that could have become plumbers, electricians, carpenters, which then go on to having their own businesses within those fields and growing those out. And, of course, because of that, we've now got a shortage of those. And when you get a plumber in or someone to do any work for you, it costs you a fortune because there's such a big skill shortage yeah. um, so I do think too many go so yes I do like the trade route and you've always got something to fall back on and while you're learning a trade you're also learning about life as well because you're meeting so many different people and seeing how the world ticks and I think that's great for setting you up if you want to go into business. How would you how would you define trade? Um, trades well realistically the plumbers the electricians anyone that does anything that takes time to learn through a proper apprenticeship i'd say that's really a, a household trade so anyone that you you actually phone in i don't know for example tree surgeon you know they cost you a fortune 
tree surgeon. Yeah. What does a tree surgeon do? Well, a heart, like pruning, heart change pruning or the trees like and all that. Okay. Well, there's, yeah. quite, there's quite a lot of work there. When you got as many trees as I have. Yeah. Get, I mean, get, I don't have a house. So in, like, <laughs> yeah. You're yeah. talking three or four grand for a visit. So, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So skills like that, I think, are, are worth investing in. Um, and I think a lot of people that do go to university, and please bear in mind, I'm not knocking university because it has its place and 100% agree with that. Um, but too many go that could make a really good career elsewhere, like and earn a lot more, not start off with the debt that they incur by mm. going to university. And I do understand there's a social element to university as well, but it's a very expensive party for three, four, five years. And yeah. so, yeah, or six years, I think, in six, your six case. years in the medical case. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> um, so what's something like, you know, learning to code and becoming a software developer through like without going to university, would you put that in the same category of quote, like learning a trade? Like you've got the skill that's taken you a while to learn and you don't necessarily need to go to university for it? Yeah, I'd certainly say so because as an employer, I always employ on experience as opposed to, um, you know, getting marks from university or whatever it happens to be or exam results because I think experience for me always counts for a lot, lot more than exam results. Yeah. Always thought that way. Yeah, so. no, absolutely. It's, it's, it's the same for us. Like, um, you're like, I think a couple of our team members didn't go to university. And I didn't even realize until like ages after we'd hired them. I was like, oh, oh shit. Oh, yeah. That's, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> yeah. It just seems a bit of a push way, doesn't it? Yeah. I don't know what your parents were like, but I'm assuming. Oh, very much academics expected, all the way forward. Yeah. It's just almost a given that you're going to go to university. Yeah. So I think, is there three rules in your household? Uh, <laughs> doctor, lawyer, or failure? And that's the one. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes <laughs> people put engineer in there instead of it, but like yeah. <laughs> doctor, lawyer, engineer, or McDonald's, those tend to be the, the, the options that you have. And we're not, mock, not, we're not knocking McDonald's, of course, are we? Yeah, a lot no, of people started there and done well as well. So. Yeah. Um, how, so let's say someone is, I don't know, 16, 17, 18 listening to this and they're thinking, I don't really know what I want to do. The default seems to be, well, for a lot of people, oh, I'll just go to uni because, it, quote, it's useful to have a degree. Yeah. Um, how should, how would you approach kind of if you were advising someone and if they were like, hey, Mark, I don't, I don't really know what to do. I'm 17. Well, what are the factors here? Personally, I, I would say, and this didn't exist when I was younger, is not necessarily a year out but spend some time doing a lot of different jobs because doing a lot of different jobs, you do find out what you don't like. So we mentioned McDonald's there. So you could flip burgers for two weeks if you wanted to, learn the ropes of the McDonald's trade, then quit, then go on to your next job, mm -hmm. learn that job, see what you didn't like from it, take the things you did and then put them together in the third job you go to. So I, I think... Taking a year away to find out what you don't like is a great way to do things. And then if the choice is to go to university because you want to be X, Y, Z that needs that, then of course you go. But the problem with going when you don't know what you want to do is that's a lot of debt. Mm. That's a hell of a lot of debt. And that debt at some point has got to be paid off. And you may never go into that job or use that degree ever again in your life. So it is a bit of a waste, I think, for a lot of people. Yeah. Even in the UK, where it, you know some people would say it's not really debt; it's more like a graduate tax. Oh, it's only nine percent, and you only have to pay off once you're earning more than twenty-five k or whatever the number is. Do you think the debt thing is still a factor that people should seriously consider? Um, I think so because I think it also limits their job options as well. Because most people that come out of university feel they're of a certain level; they don't want to earn below a certain level, and you are going to be paying it back nine times out of ten. Um, but you also job trap yourself to a certain degree as well. Using what do you mean? That. Well, you, most people that I know that have been to university that haven't got jobs are like, well, you know, I can't find a job for my qualifications. And you think, well, that's because you've studied something you didn't want to study in the first place and <laughs> yeah. there wasn't any job opportunities for that. And whoever promised you that university course was going to give you a good living yeah. at the end of it essentially lied to you because it's not there. But it is a business university, isn't it, at the end of the day? There's a lot of people making a lot of money, pushing a lot of people through, whether it's through the university itself or whether it's through the accommodation or whether it's through student unions or whatever it is, there's a lot of money being earned. So I can understand why people push youngsters that way because in a way it's an easy option, isn't it? If you don't know what to do, you've got three stroke four years of, well, I'm going to university, I'm working hard, everyone thinks I am. But then the reality will hit after that. So, mm. again, not against university before anyone feels that way. But I think a lot that go probably shouldn't. Yeah, I think I'm. I would. I would broadly agree with that. I think. Yeah, in in some schools and in, in some in some backgrounds, it's just 
you know, in my school, like 100% of people went to university and it would it was like really weird if you didn't. Mm. And The same at my yeah. son's school as well. I mean, my son, every single person in his school leaving in his year went to university. Mm. He deliberately did not go to the open days of the university because he knew he didn't want to go. And if he went to the open days, then they would probably coerce him into wanting to go you know like you can join this team you can be on that team you can do this the nightlife's great and he felt that it would hold him back and I think that's the bravest decision he's ever made because if everyone around you is going you say no I'm not you're actually the strong one in that situation and he's now built obviously a business with my well he built a business before we worked together but now we work together on YouTube and everything else that we do and on the podcast strike it big and it's it's a fantastic relationship because of that nice so you um, were a carpenter joiner for, you said, for three and a half years? Yeah. So what happened next in the career? Um, at this point, well, you'd have been like 19-ish? Yeah, 1920. Yeah. But I always knew at 16 when I left school, I wanted to be self-employed. I'd done loads of different side hustles, although they weren't called that oh, yeah. before. <laughs> uh, what, they were just what, what side, kind of side hustles. Um, I used to go fishing. Used to catch fish at Dover, catch a train the first thing in the morning for free, come back and pretend I lost my ticket. So very cost effective. <laughs> used to catch lots of mackerel. We used to take them around the house and the state selling them, um, which worked very, very well as a youngster. Um, I used to buy and sell cars as well. So I was flipping cars. That's while I was a um, carpenter and joiner. So I used to do a car a week. I'd always buy a car that I liked. So if I couldn't sell it, it didn't matter, that would be my car, but they were always Escort Mark IIs. That's the car of choice, and they always sold. And I was buying them for about £300, selling them between 500 and 600 So you double your money for a little bit of valatin, and that's all it took during the week. And then someone would come along. We'd park it on a nice estate as well when they came to visit it, so that it would give it a little bit of kudos, and um, always did very well. So always done lots of side hustles. In fact, I got to a stage where I actually ended up selling all of my time, which I don't think a lot of people understand. But, you know, when you're being paid an hourly rate at work and you're you're working every hour of the day, Saturdays I'd work part-time in a model shop. Sunday I'd be teaching people to fly model helicopters. You know, I'd actually got to a point where I sold every bit of time I had. And we went to fit um, a staircase on a customer's house. And um, I always remember it was a really, really rich guy. And I spoke to him and I said, yeah, how can you have such a great lifestyle? Because this is what I want. And I don't know if he laughed or not, but he said, you know, well, you've got to get your money to work for you. And I went, well, how's that work? So he explained, you know, about investing and having a little bit of a money starting to grow in the background. He says, if you think long term, you'll do well. If you think short term, you'll lose your investments. He said, so that was quite important at the time to me. And at the point where you've sold all your time, you've got no other way of earning money. You know, you're, you're done, aren't you? you mm. you're, you're, you're maxed out. So uh, that was quite a good turning point. Okay, two two questions on that. If I So one is, um, were you not concerned about things like work-life balance and all that stuff that is fashionable to talk about these days and very unfashionable to talk about kind of hustling and grinding and stuff? If you're selling all, all of your time, yeah, how, how are you approaching that? If at all? Um, well, to be honest, I was never really too bothered about finding the girls. Uh, I'm not the best looking chap in the world, I understand that, but I was quite a cheeky chappy, normally had a girlfriend and I didn't work hard at it. I had a girlfriend, finished with a girlfriend, had another girlfriend and so on. So that's just how it went. Um, and I think a lot of people do spend a lot of time on trying to find the one. Mm. And I, but I always believe the one will arrive if given enough time. Um, so that was fine. I, mean, I had a good social life. I enjoyed, my, enjoyed what I was doing. And when you're, for example, because I love radio control model flying and that's what my main businesses are, um, being that age and being able to fly other people's models and teach them to fly on their models without having to buy them, that was great fun anyway. So I was having fun, although my time was being sold. So that's sort of how it worked. But when I did meet the one, which obviously everyone hopefully eventually does, um, I did say to her, look, you, you need to understand I'm very selfish with my time. And she said, well, what does that mean? I said, well, when I have enough time to spend with you, it'll be 100%, you know, 100%. If we're coming up to London or we're going out on a date, 
we didn't have mobile phones there, so it was less interruptive. And if you had a date for an evening, it would be 100% of my commitment, time and everything. But in between that, you might not hear from me or you might not see me and all the rest of it. And she understood that and mm. what the long-term vision was. And I think if you're honest and upfront right from the start, then that's good. Fantastic. Um, it strikes me that the phrase selling your time is an, is, an, is, an, is an interesting phrase. Like, is that how you were thinking of it at the time? Or is that uh, sort of afterwards, as you learned more about finance, you realized you were selling your time? I think it was afterwards. Um, I, I realized that I couldn't earn any more than I was. Um, because again, there's no more time in the day to physically do it. And I think lots of people get trapped by earning a daily amount of money. And they think that's what I am worth. That's the value I'm giving. So that's what I get. Um, you, you can only increase that by giving more value, but eventually your time is limited. And again, we'll go back to the doctor analogy because this is what you are. Even as a doctor, you can high earn, can't you? Very, very good earnings. But that still caps at some point. Yep. So let's say as a doctor, you do a bit of private and all the rest of it, I don't know, a quarter of a million a year, something like that. You're still capped at that. That's yep. it. There's no more unless yeah. you make your money work for you. Um, now, obviously, I wasn't at that amount of money. I was probably back in the day, I don't know, 15, 20,000, something like that, which was double what I was earning in my job, mm. way over double, actually. Um, so what can I do? You are trapped, and I realised it, but it was explained later that you'd sold all your time. Yeah. Mm. I like that 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 phrasing, selling your time. I think it's you know there's that thing of there's nothing that ruins more dreams than uh, the security of a, a a monthly salary or mm. or a daily wage. Um, well, it's and, a comfort, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, and I I think lots of people will moan about that they don't get paid enough, um, but they don't want to do anything about that. And that's the crucial point. It's that comfort stage. And when you're comfortable, why do you need to do anything about it? I'm comfortable. I can moan about it, bitch about it, whine about it. But actually, I am comfortable. And that is a dangerous position if you want to be rich. You had this then this this conversation which is with the super rich guy that you were installing the the, yeah. the stairs for. How did how did that change things for you? Um, it made me look at investing. Um, what I would have liked is someone like myself or someone like you available to be able to look up and study because I, I think YouTube has opened up what the schools haven't been able to provide. And if we'd have had financial lessons at school, yeah. I'd have been hands up to go to it because I, I, I've always liked earning money. I've always liked, you know, finding ways of making it, but School teaches you to go out and find a job to earn money, but it doesn't teach you what to do with that once you've got it. And I think that's where YouTube has certainly jumped in. And the whole reason we started the YouTube was because we were on a skiing trip and we noticed the ski in France up on the wall there. Um, and we were in a chalet and I have told the story a few times, but we were around a table. There was four youngsters and I say youngsters, 18, 19 year olds, maybe a little bit older than that. And for two hours after dinner, all they talked about or asked questions about was business and finance. And I didn't know where the time had gone. I spoke to my son afterwards. He said, look, that was two hours. They were interested in what you had to say. I said, well, aren't they teaching this? And they went, no. So, you know, I think you get to a certain stage in business where you think this is all common sense, common knowledge. Everyone knows this, but actually it's the opposite. They don't. And, you know, they're eager to listen and to learn and to, to move forward. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so you, so you have this conversation um, as, you're, as you're installing the, the staircase. What happens next in your life? Um, well, I, I left work, started the business, um, and we're starting a business as well. Again, a lot of people turn off on YouTube when you start talking business because they think it's all complicated and difficult and hard, whereas actual fact is the, the complete opposite. Uh, most people I find when I talk to them think they have to know everything about business. They've got to go to business school or, or do business studies or go to university to study it, and they're the people that go into business, whereas the reality is we're all winging it. I mean, to a certain degree, I would say you're, you've probably done the same yeah, with this that? business. <laughs> You know. every single day is just yeah. trying to make shit up as we go along and you learn the lessons as you go on yeah. and those lessons sometimes are hard learned they cost you some money 
but sometimes they make you a lot of money. Mm. But whatever way it is, it's a lesson and you don't forget it because you've learned it yourself. It's not someone else telling you that lesson. You've learned it and you move on from that. And it's, it's a great way to be. Um, I think the advantage youngsters have now, which they don't really see, is everything's a possibility now. When I was at school, it was, what are you going to be? Yeah. Well, I do. I wanted to be a pilot, first of all. I wanted to join the RAF and be a fighter pilot and drive those fast blow torches around the sky. Uh, but I got the bins, and obviously from there on, I, I, that wasn't going to be a possibility. So the only other thing I was good at was carpentry and joinery, so I, I stuck onto that. But also, I'd have liked to have been a racing car driver, or I'd like to have been... Yeah, you know, any multitude of different things, but that was for someone else. That that wasn't for me. You know, that wasn't possible. Hmm. You know, that that was a barrier. No, you you've got to decide what you want to be, and you've got to decide that now. And you can't have anything too advanced because you're never going to get there. And that was quite a hard knock all the time. Hmm. Very very hard knock. But that was common. That was very common back then. Whereas today, there's more kind of possibility in people's minds i think i think yeah. so yeah i mean again you went to university to study medicine and now you're into youtube and social media yeah, and all bit, this sort of thing <laughs> and yeah y you don't know where you're going to go but the possibilities are there aren't yeah. they you know if you had if you were at school now and you liked motorsport for example and you thought well i could do that and you've been to the car circuit and you go oh, i'm actually not too bad at this mm. you know that that is actually a career path whether you can follow it or not that's down to you as an individual but it's a career path i thought it's just something you know racing drivers did yeah i didn't know where they came from it's just racing drivers job yeah i guess partly it's it's, it's sort of like two things for like i think for me i was very lucky in the sense of you know, being born in the right place, the right set of parents, privilege and all that kind of stuff. But I think also there's an informational advantage that people have today that they didn't back in the day. It's 100%. like today, if you think you want to be a whatever, you can just Google it and someone will have made a day in the life of a whatever video. Yeah. And you can literally see the YouTube channels of F1 drivers and see what, what they're up to day to day. And you think, huh, that's interesting. Mm. Or you can listen to them on a three hour long podcast where they literally break the, break down their entire journey. Yeah. So I think that's like, yeah, one of the one of the really cool things. And in a way, like I've I've spoken to a lot of people recently who feel that, again, to, to your point, the university industrial complex takes in all of these like varied and interesting individuals and spits them out to become an identical automaton yeah. going to consulting or whatever other, you know, accounting or whatever, you know, obviously consultants and accountants mm -hmm. all, all good, just using that as an example. I mean, for you yeah. to, to switch from being in medical, in medicine mm -hmm. to what you're doing now, I mean, that, that must have been a very brave move. Um, I think once the business started to do well, it felt less less like bravery and more like common sense. Um, mm. and and the tide was already slowly starting to turn, and that maybe in my ear, five percent of people were like, oh, I don't really, I don't really want to do medicine. These days, I speak to medical students, and they're like, thirty percent of my year group, they realize they don't want to do medicine. So it seems like again, I think with the availability of information and like social media, the internet, etc., people are realizing that the path that they are set on at the age of 16, at least in the UK, where you start choosing your yeah. A-levels and stuff, is not necessarily the path you have to continue following for the mm. rest of your life. But 10 years ago, if you'd become a doctor, mm. you'd have done that till the day you retired. Yeah, probably. And there were very few examples of like, you know, people yeah. starting a, inventing a surgical equipment or something like that. Yeah. That's what I imagined I would do. I was like, I'm going to be a doctor forever. Mm. And on the side, I'm going to try and invent some kind of tech thing. Yeah. Um, but even then, that was because when I was like 13, I started making websites for money. And so I already had that business thing going on the side. Yeah. Whereas most people weren't thinking in those ways and were just focused on getting through the... But that's the entrepreneurial spirit, isn't yeah. it? You know, and I think that's in from a very early age, uh, regardless of who you are. Um, I don't think you can be taught that. Um, you can be taught business without a doubt, and you can learn business, and you can have a go, and you can learn investing, and you can have a go. But entrepreneurial spirit, you can't just say, I'm going to become an entrepreneur, you know, it's what you are. How did you? So, do you do you think that some something people someone can develop? I think um, ninety percent of people can can be pretty good at whatever they decide they want to be if they're dedicated enough to it. Um, but to be a hundred percent good at it, that's that's the hard bit, mm. and that's the difference, isn't it? Really, yeah. Between most people, because I think in a way you've got to you've got to enjoy it as well. Yeah. Like I was I was interviewing um a chap called Marcus yesterday who's like a, an uh, Olympic medalist in tennis and I asked him kind of 
if you want to become a, a pro professional tennis player, what's that? What's the balance between like discipline and just sort of pushing through it? And he was like, it's just impossible. Like, unless you genuinely enjoy it, it's impossible to just get punched in the face repeatedly, <laughs> yeah. which is what happens when you're trying to play professional tennis. Yeah, I'd, so, I'd agree yeah. with that. I mean, I chose radar control models as my main business, but that's because I was so into it. Yeah. And I, I was pretty good at it as well you know i traveled the world representing the uk team um and we did quite well as a team as well we got bronze medals at european championships and world championships so that that's pretty good and that helps build that business as well so if you've got a passion for the thing you enjoy and you can see a way to make money from it it's great but it's no good at just being a passion yeah. because so many <laughs> passion businesses just go down the pan because they don't look at the business side of it first and i was always very much this is my hobby side of what i do for my business this is my business you know and they're two completely different things you know when you're doing it as a hobby you can be friends with everyone when you're doing it as a business you can't you know it's as simple as that yeah it's the same analogy that i so um in my course we teach people how to be youtubers um and one of the things i always ask people is are you treating youtube as a hobby or are you treating youtube as a business and you can't say 50 50 on both because you know mm. you've got it you've got to pick a side because that radically changes the way you approach it yeah if you're treating youtube as a hobby great make videos about whatever you feel like follow your passion all that kind of stuff mm. if you're treating it like a business then let's analyze the market let's figure out how you're going to stand out let's like you know take it a treat it treat it like an actual business person would treat a business yeah rather than hoping that hey if i just do my hobby thing it'll just magically make me money um so how did you decide that you wanted to so what was the business that you initially started and how did you decide to go down that route? Uh, the initial business, again, was radar control models. I bought a shop because the only way you could start a real business like that was having a shop. I mean, I'd done the side hustle part of it, which was repairing people's models on the side and teaching people to fly them. Um, but the next logical step was to, to get a shop. So that's what I did. Um, and from day one, it was very good. Uh, how, how did you get a shop? Like, what is, what well, <laughs> yeah. uh, well, basically, I just went, I, I did a business plan. I spent weeks and weeks and weeks drawing up this business plan. I tried to cover everything I could. I worked part-time for someone so that I knew what I needed to do. Um, he actually stole my plans, <laughs> which was a pain, to be honest, but I wasn't quite ready to go. He actually opened a shop exactly where I was going to open it with the same name as well. He stole everything. Um completely other st another story <laughs> um but i did a business plan when i was ready which okay. was six months following this um and on this business plan it laid out what we could make what my expertise was where we were going to do it rents everything took it to um the bank manager and he turned me down flat he didn't even give me really the time of day it was literally well you've made an appointment i've got to see you but no Okay. You know, if I could sum it up any better than that, I would. But that was what it felt like to me. And I came out of the bank and I went, well, this is either dead in the water, never going to happen, or I've got to go forward with it and try and do something. And when you've been slapped pretty hard like that, it is actually quite hard to see a positive. So I could have turned right, I could have turned left. So I decided to turn right. The bank next door, next door but one was Barclays. I went in there. I said, oh, I've got an appointment with the manager. And they went, oh, you're not down. I went, oh, no, definitely. It's uh, 11 o'clock. Uh, yeah, I'm a bit early. Maybe that's it. No, no. You, oh, we'll, we'll let you see him anyway. So I went in and saw him, um, gave him the business plan, spoke about it. He went, yeah, I want to back you. He said, I'll be your first customer. Oh, wow. Just like that pretty good isn't it that's pretty good yeah i think he had um a certain amount of money that they had to potentially lend out to start up businesses yeah. um and obviously we had to cover it with you know the, the 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 property i had and various other things but it was a yes it was a definite yes and that was a, a big thing all right, we're just gonna take a quick break from this episode to introduce our sponsor, which is very excitingly Huel. Now, Huel is great because I've been a customer of Huel for the last six years. And also we've got an interview with Julian Hearn, who is the founder of Huel on this podcast. So you can check that out. It'll be on the YouTube channel and on the Spotify page. And that was a fantastic masterclass in entrepreneurship. But anyway, we're talking about Huel because Huel is a fantastically complete meal. So if you're like me and you have a fairly busy life and you don't necessarily make the time to shop and cook and prep and wash up like a healthy meal at home, which is obviously ideal, then the nice thing about Huel is that it's a great alternative to an unhealthy cereal or an unhealthy takeaway meal, for example. I particularly like the Huel Black Edition because this is high protein and lower carb. So for 400 calories, you get 40 grams of protein. And so this is absolutely fantastic for workout days where I'm trying to get my 160, 180 grams of protein in. And it's also great because the high protein helps me stay full for a lot longer. I take my two scoops of the Black Edition powder. I like the Banana Edition and the Salted Caramel Edition. I'll mix it up in my Nutribullet blender thing with water and maybe a little bit of milk sometimes. 
And then I'll just sip on that while I'm working at my desk and that will get me the appropriate level of protein that I need. It'll get me a decent chunk of carbohydrates and fibers and fat and also 26 different vitamins and minerals, which are generally very good for the body. It's also very reasonably priced. Like if you work it out, it comes out to one pound 68 per meal-ish, which is about 400 calories. And that's way cheaper than an alternative would be if you were ordering takeout, for example. So if that sounds up your street and you would like a nutritionally complete and affordable and healthy option for some of your meals, then head over to huel.com forward slash deep dive. And if you use that URL, heal.com forward slash deep dive, they will send you a free t-shirt and also a free shaker bottle thing with your first order. I still use my t-shirt. It's great. It's nice elastic heat. It fits reasonably well. It makes me look kind of hench. So you can check that out, heal.com forward slash deep dive. So thank you so much, Heal, for sponsoring this episode. This episode is very kindly brought to you by Trading212. Now, people ask me all the time for advice about investing because I've made a bunch of videos about it on the YouTube channel. And my advice for most people is generally invest in broad stock market index funds, which is exactly what you can do completely for free with Trading212. It's a great app that lets you trade stocks and funds and ETFs and foreign exchange if you really want to. And one of the great things about the app is that if you're new to the world of investing, you can actually invest with fake money. You don't have to put real money in. They've got a practice mode where you invest fake money and then it actually tracks what the market is doing in real time. So you can see, had I invested hundred pounds into this thing, what would my return have been? X weeks or X months further down the line. Once you've got some comfort with that, then it's super easy to deposit money into your trading two into account. You can use Apple Pay like I do initially, or you can use a direct bank transfer. And then once the money is in your Trading212 account, then you can invest it in basically whatever you want. The other really cool feature about Trading212 is their pies feature. So what you can do is you can follow people who've created investing pies. For example, someone might have a pie where, I don't know, 30% of it's Apple and 20% is Tesla and 10% is the S&P 500. And you can follow people on the app and see what pies they've created. And you can see the performance of those pies. And then you can just copy and paste a particular pie into your own account. And so that means like, let's say you've got hundred pounds to invest and you've put 50 of it into the S&P 500, but you want to be a little bit more experimental with the other 50 pounds, you could invest it into a pie where someone else who's generally a pro or someone in their bedroom who just loves the markets has already done all the homework for you. The app also lets you auto invest, which is a great thing because then you can automatically invest a percentage of your paycheck into the thing every month. And so if you haven't yet started with investing and you want to give it a go, then you can download the app on the app store. And if you use the coupon code Ali, A-L-I at the checkout, that will give you a totally free share worth up to a hundred pounds. It's available on iPhone and Android, and you can check it out by typing in trading212 into your respective app store. So thank you so much trading two on two for sponsoring this episode like my brother is a tech startup founder and so i'm familiar with that side of things where they've got like venture capital backing yeah but i've just never really clocked that you can literally walk into a bank with a business plan on a piece of paper and ask them for money is, 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 that, is that how it works i'm not sure you get it now <laughs> yeah. um, but back then certainly it was a business plan and okay. i think when you had managers back then the managers of a branch would have you know the, the final say over quite a lot of things yeah. nowadays it would probably go through all sorts of committee and different things mm. but yeah it's li literally a business loan uh, it was a startup loan it wasn't for the amount i needed even with what i had it wasn't enough yeah. but if the business was successful enough for the first two months, it would be enough. And yeah. uh, that, that's the way I worked it. And the first day when we opened up, I was so skint. I had nothing. Yeah. I didn't even have enough fuel to get home. I took a sleeping bag and put it in the back of the van I had because if I didn't take any money, I wasn't able to get home that night. Wow. But that's full commitment, isn't it? Yeah. And if you're going to do anything, commit. Yeah. Because then there's no option. It works or it doesn't, but you're going to do as much as you can to make that work. Were you not worried that you were going to like lose the house and like all of the fears that would, yeah. Actually, I was 20. What's the worst that can happen when you're 20? This is the thing I can't seem to get through to a lot of people. What's the worst thing? You lose what you have. You're 20. Mm -hmm. You've got all your life ahead of you to restart something else. Yeah. I mean, how exciting is that? It's brilliant. You know, everything's on the line. Did you have that perspective when you were 20? I mean, yeah. like when I was 20, I was like, oh shit, if I lose everything, if I get kicked no. out of med school, suddenly, like, suddenly my life is over. Yeah, but I couldn't see it going wrong. Okay. But it was exciting. Yeah. So it's that excitement is what you want and uh, that drives you on. And we had a cracking day, yeah. you know. I, I say that now, it's just over a hundred pounds we took, just over. And to this day, and this is another thing in retail that amazes me. We've never, ever had a day where we've taken less than £100 on a day we've opened, ever, even in the early days. Um, and what amazes me is people have to decide to come to your shop, mm. particularly back then, no internet, no eBay, all that sort of thing. So they've got to come to your shop, make that active decision to come in and buy something. And uh, I always thought, you've got to have a day when no one decides to come to your shop, haven't yeah. you? 
but we never have, which That's is quite amazing, isn't it? That's amazing. Um, what? Okay, I've got a friend who's super into um, burgers. He just loves making burgers, makes burgers for all his friends. And he says, one day I really want to open like a burger shop or like a burger van or something like that. If that person was on your ski trip being like, hey, Mark, how do I, how do I turn this into a business? What would be the steps that you would follow today, assuming you can't just walk into Barclays and be like, hey, can I have a loan? Well, the, or, the problem with food is yeah. 80% of food ventures fail. Okay. So it's a pretty bad statistic, isn't it? particularly restaurants. Um, so the best plan of attack is to be the 20%, not the 80 straight away. Okay. So there you go. That's the best device you can have because that's the, that's the one that's going to win. You've got to have something a bit different as well. And again, with burgers, it's very difficult, isn't it? Because you would think, or I would, I'm not into burgers, um, but you would think everything's been done. And then you look at um, one burger outlet that we went in in, in, in the States, in and out Burgers. All right, the simplest menu you ever did see. Okay, so there's three different options. They're just the same burger made in three different ways, and they were absolutely flat out. My son, who's sitting over there, absolutely loved it. Kept yeah. taking me back to this place. <laughs> I say, God, if only they did a chicken burger as well, it'd be great. <laughs> but because they specialise and their menu is so small, you know, people know what they're going there for, and they do a very, very good job of it. Mm. So I would probably say to anyone that's going to start and do a burger van or something like that, make it simple. Mm. And make it so you can repeat what you do. And when someone comes back the next week because they enjoyed your burger, make sure it's just as good. It's exactly the same as it was the last time they had it. Because the worst thing you can do is make this wonderful burger. And then the next week, I'm going to cut down on the cheese. I'm going to cut that a little bit thinner. I'm going to just, you know, I'm going to now start portioning the sauce a little bit less because these are key savings to make my business work better and put more profit on my own margin. But as soon as you start destroying that product or, or bringing it down from what people like, it just gets worse and worse and worse. And you might get a third visit, but you won't get a fourth you know, the second visit's because they enjoyed the first one. Yep. The third visit was because they thought the second one, well, maybe you made a bit of a mistake, but I'm still after that ultimate burger I had the first time I came. I ain't coming a fourth time for mm. something that wasn't as good as the first time. So for a business like that, that requires some level of startup capital, how would, how would you approach finding the money, assuming you don't have rich parents to give it to you? The three Fs, friends, families, and fools. <laughs> okay because they're there out there aren't they yeah. why, why borrow it from somewhere where you don't where you've got to pay that interest back so those are your free places to start with if you get enough from that then you can go to the banks the banks will give you some money without mm. a doubt so then you can go that way i've never gone to a venture capitalist ever i've never done fundraising never gone down that route obviously some businesses need it because they have to go through this and i hate this word burn stage Burn stage? Well, well then burning oh, the money, yeah. you know, trying to build that brand. Yeah. You know, if you've got a good brand, it should pretty much start organically growing. Mm. Um, so I hate a burn stage. And people that tend to um, raise money in that way do mm. tend to think, oh, I've got plenty of money. We can do that. We can do that. Before you know it, it's gone. So a lack of money or certainly a small amount of money at the start is actually a bit of a superpower. Because it makes you make the most of all your free advertising, everything that's available to you to make, you know, the best decisions from. So it depends what it needs. I mean, if it's a startup burger van, how much can that really cost? I mean, you need a van, you need to adapt it, do it yourself if you can. You've got your recipe, you've got your menu. 10, 15,000, find a pitch. Nowadays, you're more likely to have to pay for a decent pitch. But back in my day, you'd have just wheeled up wherever you wanted to and put your sign out. Yeah. But just keep turning up, keep doing it. Yeah. You know, it's uh, it's all doable. But, there, you know, a lot of people will put excuses all along the way, of course. Yeah. Yeah, I think especially for, like, this is partly why I really like, you know, when, when, when people ask me, oh, you know, I want to get rich, what do I do? Often I'm like, okay, well, there's a lot of books you can read and stuff. But, like, if you learn how to code, that is a uh, very good way to get into the business thing because almost every software business that you start does not need startup capital. You can get your yeah. $10,000 of Amazon Web Services credit for free. You don't need to spend 15K on a van. Um, and you can almost kind of quote, be profitable from day one. You're not in that quote burn stage where 
crap, I've just spent 15 grand and now I need to recoup that over the next five years and then I'll become profitable. Mm. And the other beauty of a digital product is you can obviously be anywhere in the world producing that digital product. So your overheads can be cut to an absolute minuscule amount if you want to. And you can be in a beautiful part of the world for very little money producing your product. So yeah, digital products are fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, similarly, I get I get emails from people being like, hey, can you do a video about passive income ideas from Pakistan? And I'm like, well, no, because I'm not in Pakistan right now. But also, like, passive income ideas from Pakistan is the same as passive income ideas on the internet yeah. anywhere else because the internet is not localized. So I think there's definitely something to be said for using the power of the internet, which wouldn't have been a thing back in your day, to start businesses that can benefit from that location independence and also the scale. And the trouble, you mentioned passive income. Most people's definition of that is it's a business that's going to give me money and I haven't got to do anything. But the the, the, def, the real definition of a passive uh, business is it's going to cost you either time or money or a combination of the two. So whatever way you look at it, you know, it's not really passive. You know, it's got to have that initial investment of time or money or both. Um. Let's go back to this guy that you were um, installing the stairs for. So it, it strikes me that there are two directions you could you, you could have gone from there. The guy's saying, to telling you, you know, make your money work work for you. And I'm going to use the terminology from MJ DeMarco, who you might be familiar with, where it's like you can go down the slow lane approach or the fast lane yeah. approach. And the slow lane would be, okay, I'm making, I don't know, two k a month. My costs are 1.8K. I can save 10% of my paycheck every month and I can put it into the S&P 500. Yep. And someone, I, w- I watched a video on YouTube from Ali Abdal telling me that Warren Buffett says you should invest in the S&P 500. Great. Yep. That money's growing by 7% a year. By the time I'm 55, I should it should be worth a million. Versus I'm going to take that <laughs> spare 200 quid and I'm going to use it to start my own business. What do you think about those two different Well, two I different used routes? a combination of the two. Um, I've always put away approximately 10% of what I earn into an index fund. Nice. <laughs> always from from about 18. Nice. So I, I'm sorted, aren't I? You know, because, you know, that, that was always going to become a big amount. I can draw down on it now if I want. But, of course, why would I? I've got 10 years of hopefully amazing growth. Um, but I've also gone, hopefully, partway down the fast lane. Um, and that is obviously opening a business, investing in myself, investing in the business and pushing that forward forward um there's lots of hurdles along the way though you know like shops were a great thing to have when i started you know the model shops and we you know built those shops up to various you know several different shops um but then of course the internet hits and then having brick stores isn't the way to be so you, you've got to adapt that business um so now we're talking 35 years on from when i started and we're still in business doing a similar thing but we're doing it in a completely different way so i think an entrepreneur sees um answers as opposed to hurdles or they might see a hurdle they get over it and move on you know don't get stuck by it and uh, that's what we try and do so 35 years ago when you started the business were you thinking you know 35 years later i'm still going to be doing this or were you more like short term in your um i would say it was a lifetime sort of uh business at the time definitely um because I think most passion businesses are. Um, I think the ones that aren't are the ones with the exit strategies are more tech type businesses. Um, and if I was advising your friend with the burger van, um, I would probably say that the, the the main thing to focus on is your exit. To be perfectly honest, where where where's it going? Where's your finish stage? Because if you don't have an exit strategy, you haven't got anything that's sellable. So a few years back, probably 10 years back, I decided that wasn't something I had an exit strategy at all to the business I was in. And so I've made it or adapted it. So at any point, should I now want to sell it, I have a role in exit strategy. So year on year on year. And it's now a turnkey business as opposed to being um, fully dependent on myself, which it, it was. Obviously, we had staff, but you know, you take take me out of it 10 years ago, it wouldn't have operated. But now it will operate very well with the staff that we had. Again, I refer to yourself, similar to yourself, you have a very good team behind you. And once you have a very good team, then the business can roll on a daily basis. Yeah, I think the thing for me is, you know, people, uh, I was in uh, Miami earlier this week. Everyone's there was like 
multi-million slash 10 million agencies and talking about selling to private equity for 20x profit. And I was just like, damn, I don't think I have an exit strategy. But for me and this business, I don't really think of it as a business, but I feel like I don't really want an exit strategy. Um, the For me, making YouTube videos, interviewing people, writing books and stuff, that's more like a lifestyle choice mm. rather than a, quote, business. Well, similar to my lifestyle yeah. business <laughs> because the enjoyment was there. Yeah. So, you know, it rolled and rolled and the enjoyment came yep. every day. Yeah. You know, that, that's the great thing with enjoying what you do, isn't it? It's, yeah. a, it, it's a fun time. You, know, you are going to work and, yes, you do work hard, but the work you do, you enjoy. Yeah. So it's, you're rewarded every day. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess further down the line, if I did decide, okay, this is no longer that fun. Let's now let's maybe figure out an exit strategy, license the IP. There's you know, there's then things that you can do yeah. to build to sell, as it were. Um just to take things back to complete basics, what is a business? If someone's listening to this and they're like, like I feel like the word business is is, you know, we're talking about exit strategies, you know, I just threw out, you know, 20x profit. For someone who doesn't understand what's going on, it's like the word business can feel very daunting. So how would you break that down like most simply? Well, if you want to boil it down to really the brass tacks, it's buying something and selling it for a profit. That's the brass tacks of business, isn't it, really? Uh, or producing something and adding value to it and selling it for a profit. So it can be as simple as a side hustle. And the reason side hustle is so popular, I think, on YouTube is because people don't think it's a business where of course, it is a business. It's only when you go into scale that the problems obviously come. Um, but a side hustle essentially is a business. And no one's scared, or very few people are scared of a little side hustle. Yeah. But they're scared of doing a business. Yeah, that's true. But really, they're the same thing, just slightly bigger. Um, a lot of people think business is when you start employing people. Of course, it's not. It's way before that. But the employment thing is a is a big trigger or a, a hard point to get over when you get to that stage. So, when you're selling, when you're repairing model airplanes on the side, would is that is that a business? Um, I or, would say it is okay. because you become known for it. If you're known for something and that's what you do, I would say, well, it is a business because it was the start of a business as well. Without that, the business wouldn't have started. It wouldn't have had the capital to be able to start. You know, what I was earning from that, you know, made me more money. So if you take um, the repairing people's models scenario, I was working part-time in a model shop. So I had quite a lot of customer base from that. I wouldn't go out and teach them to fly, they'd crash their model, it would need repairing. The, or if they didn't crash it, I would be able to suggest how we could make that model fly better. And my speciality was radar control helicopter, so there was always upgrades, always. So or what you need on that, you need the new metal head or the titanium tail boom or whatever it happened to be that would improve it for you. And it'd be like, well, I don't know how to do that. Well, leave it with me. When we come back for a lesson next week, I'll have it all done for you. So you've got the spare parts that I was buying with a trade discount because I'm working in a store, so that's great. You sell at full price. You've got the repair costs and labour, maybe an hour, always charged to the hour. That's always a good tip. You know, if it takes you half an hour, your minimum's an hour. And you had, you know, supplied it back. They were going to be there the following weekend because they wanted to pick up their pride and joy, so they're not going to not turn up for their lesson. So it's actually... That is a business, yeah. you know, and it's only then scale in it that people have the issue with. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I like that definition of business. It makes it feel a lot less daunting because mm. I think even like before, I think, yeah, for me, I, when I was doing my web web design type stuff, I was uh, we are really thinking of myself as a business I, or even trying trying to act as if I was a bigger agency than I actually was, mm. just one man job, hoping people would give me work. But yeah, the word business does seem very daunting to people. And thinking of it as this, you're you're taking a thing, you're you're buying a thing, you're adding value to it, and you're selling it for a profit. It's strange, isn't yeah. it? Really. Also, the other hard thing when you're doing it as a side hustle is understanding what you're worth as well, hmm. because your value you're adding quite often is a lot more than you're charging for, as well. So if you're charging an hourly rate of thirty pounds, forty pounds, fifty, hundred pounds, yeah. and you are booked out, yep. I mean, it's obvious to look at that now and go, well, I was worth more than that. I should have charged more. But at the time, you think you're charging about the right amount, and that's why you're busy. But, you know, you could you could 
let's say you doubled the amount you charged and you lost a quarter of the people, you're earning more money yeah. and you're working less time. Yeah. And that's quite a hard lesson to learn when you're starting out in business. Why do you think people have such a an aversion to price and money? Um, <laughs> this, this will get political, unfortunately. <laughs> um, I think before... Um, I'll say it before mm. Margaret Thatcher came into power because I always blame her a little bit for everyone trying to get the best price on everything before that I think it I always felt it was what something cost was what something cost you went and you bought it and I think she brought a lot of Americanisms in where you you know you question the price and you ask for a discount and all that sort of thing so I'd say that's where that stemmed from and of mm. course now it's a worldwide market with the web and the web in certain aspects, is a, it's a race to the bottom on price, um, particularly with the likes of Amazon and all the rest of them with their bulk buying power and not having to declare profits and all the rest of it. Um, so people are always after a bargain now. And I think that I would say that's where it started, in my opinion. Before then, it was you paid the price. And like, I think the, there's also an interesting phenomenon on the, on the other side. So my, my singing teacher, Josh, it's charging like I'm glad you're having lessons, by the way. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I need it. <laughs> um, my singing teacher Josh it was charging like I think like thirty quid an hour initially, and is ridiculously qualified. It li- literally has performed in Broadway musicals and has done TV work and is amazing. And I was like, why are you only charging thirty quid an hour? And he was like, oh, I don't feel right. I don't feel right charging thirty five mm. or forty. Even though his business is not particularly profitable, because we were talking about it, I was like, dude. Surely, just like double the prices, because you know that thing of yeah. maybe you lose twenty five percent of your customer. Who cares? You you double your prices, yeah. and, and if he was you like, do you can always come back. For yeah, the price you exactly. were charging. <laughs> and he felt like the, it, he 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 said he felt bad increasing the prices because he felt like it wasn't worth he mm. it wasn't worth it even the people were willing to pay. Do you see that kind of thing at all amongst amongst people that you talk to? I think a lot of people undercharge. I mean, I used to race um, cars, full size cars. It was a Great hobby, by the way. If right. you ever get into it, it's yeah. fantastic. Um, I don't now. I sponsor someone in the British Touring Cars, but I used to race cars, and I used to have a guy who used to do a lot of the mechanic in for me on that car, and I'd deliver it to him. He'd tell me what he's done, and he'd say, oh, 75 quid, sorry about that. And I'd think, God, I was expecting £200 on that bill. And I'd go, hey, I have 125 Really? Yeah, 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 I have it. He went out of business. He was in business as a mechanic for about four or five years, went out of business and I know why he went out of business I told him why he was gonna go out of business and he wasn't charging enough you know but he was so afraid and I don't know why people don't try because trying to charge a little more is an experiment in business isn't it and you push it to as far as you can because you can only make that profit once from that customer you know you don't want to rip anyone off I would never say go and rip people off but you're providing value and it's what you put as that value and that's an important amount of money if your customers think what you're doing is worth more than you're giving them i mean why does it not listen Mm. yeah why why do you think people have that fear that fear of charging more i think they think they'll lose everyone or feel they're ripping someone off they don't value their skill enough which is a shame because skills take a long time to establish. So again, if you want to boil it down to learning to fly a model helicopter, that to the stage from from getting an RC helicopter all those years ago, and they were hard to fly. I mean, they didn't really fly. They beat the air into submission, basically. Um, but to learn to fly a model helicopter took me the best part of a year to get to the stage where I could teach. Now, some people, it took a lot, lot longer than that. But for me, it took a year. That is a lot of flying, time, parts spare parts when you break the model that's a lot of investment isn't it and you've got to get that back so it's got to be worth something yeah absolutely yeah i think when i first started charging for for our course about two and a bit years ago i was so scared i was like oh i'm gonna people are gonna think i'm a sellout like i've built an audience off of free content and now i'm gonna charge for something oh my god and then like it's kind of expensive so like the people in my audience who can't afford it are going to think I'm a terrible person. And there were all these fears I had around mm. money. And I think what was underlying that was the idea that money is evil and making money is bad and making money by charging people for things is worse. <laughs> and it just had, there was a lot of untangling I had to do. 
Was that something that you've 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 come across? I've never struggled with it really. Yeah. Um, with I mean, you get people knocking drop shipping, don't you? Oh, you've bought that from Alibaba for ten dollars, and you're selling it to me for thirty dollars. That's a rip off. Well, what do Walmart do? What do Sainsbury's do? What do all these companies do? They buy for a low price, they sell for a high price, and the value they put in between is why they can get that profit mm. why why would you say that's a ripoff it's not a ripoff that's what i want to sell that product for so why why should you struggle with that mm. yeah if no one wants to buy it then then you then i've got a problem yeah. because i can't earn the margin i need to survive in business so i either i've got to change my business model or i've got to look at my margins and see if i can you know rely on less but there's always a figure that you can't yeah. do less than it's just not worth your while mm. Yeah. And if you're not earning money, what is the point? And the thing with courses, I mean, I, I only provide free content, as you're aware. Um, and I don't have a problem with courses. I think courses such as your own and others are very good and provide excellent value. But, of course, there is the other side of it. And you know the people that, that produce bad courses and mm. they, they are a ripoff without a doubt. You know, so it's very hard to justify the cost of yours, but you know the effort that's gone into what you're producing. Again, that's the value you're adding. And if that's good value, then you should never be ashamed to, to charge for it, ever. The fact that you can now sell millions of a digital product, that's immaterial. Mm. You've still put that value in. Yeah. Yeah, I think another thing that I have appreciated over time is sort of, I think, cost-based versus value-based pricing, mm. where I think people are in, are often thinking, oh, this only took me half an hour, therefore I'll charge based on that, versus that half an hour has added 500 grand in sales to this, this company that you've just tweaked the headline for. So let's charge based on the value we've provided rather than the cost it costs us to 100%. just do the thing. Yeah. Well, it goes to like a story of the guy that fixes the computer. I mean, a guy goes to this massive computer place, let's call it IBM, and they don't know what's wrong with their big blue computer or whatever it was called at the time. And he turns up, he looks around, and he takes out a component, puts a new component, bam, it goes into life. And he says, there's my invoice, £20,000. And they said, £20,000, you're only here five minutes. Yeah, but it took me years to know what component to take out to make that work. Mm. That's my value. Mm. Do you want me to take it back out? Yeah. No. <laughs> right, okay, £20,000. Yeah, perfectly. <laughs> and also, if that computer is printing them like £100,000 a minute, it's like, <laughs> you know. <laughs> exactly. To them, those five minutes are worth 500 k Yeah. So, But, you know, that that knowing that component might have taken him yeah. 50,000 hours of gaining knowledge to mm. know that's the component that you need to change. So they're actually paying a proportion of that 50,000 hours of learning. Yeah, true. They're paying for it back. Um, so what, is, what does your model business do these days? What does it look like? What does it look like? Um, at the moment, we have um, a couple of shops um, that sell direct to public. Uh, they also sell on eBay and also via the website. Um, there's still a very big enjoyment for me. And if I get time, I'm behind the counter from time to time, not, not as much as I'd like to be, but I still get a kick out of, of selling a product, particularly yeah. if someone comes in and they don't know what they're buying and I can explain, you know, ask them, you know, who they're buying it for, what they want it to do and all the rest of it. And I can explain the best package and they go, yeah, I'll have that. That's, that's, that's quite a kick. You know, mm. you, yeah, it's really nice and you know, they're going to love the product and mm. that's brilliant. So that's the shop side of the business. Then we also have um, a design, import, manufacturing and distribution business as well. Um, and we manufacture in China and also in Vietnam. And they're my own designs that we, we manufacture. Um, and the best selling one of those designs is a model called the Riot, which is a model aeroplane. Um, and I designed that when I was 14 in a geography lesson at no school. Way. Wow. Yeah, it took me years to make it. Yeah. Um, and the reason it took so long is because there used to be a product leader in the market. Mm. Um, and I had a deal with him because I knew he was getting quite old, that when he retired, he would pass those design rights to me and I'd continue that brand um, and he'd have a royalty. Um, but like in business, there's always a bit of backstabbing some, one, somewhere down the line. And he passed it to someone else and I said well yeah listen on he said well I promised that to him before I said well you could have let me know but I had all these models that I designed as a kid and I went right here we go let, let's get them manufactured and now 
we are more prolific than the models we would have taken on. Because they're better, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <Obviously>. <laughs> and I designed those because I couldn't afford the kits when I was a, a, a youngster. You know, so I'd use the woodwork lessons. Well, after school, they had a woodwork lesson. I'd cut out the sides of the models and use the technical drawing tables as well to do the final designs. You know, use what you've got available for free. A bit like where you start a business. Use your advertising tools that are free. Use everything you can. Don't just go, how much does this cost to advertise and give them all your money. You know, it, it's about using what you've got. This episode is very kindly brought to you by WeWork. Now, this is particularly exciting for me because I have been a full paying customer of WeWork for the last two years now. I discovered it during, you know, when the pandemic was in the, on the verge of being lifted and I'd spent like the whole year just sort of sitting in my room making YouTube videos. But then I discovered WeWork and I was a member, me and Angus, my team members, we were members of the WeWork in Cambridge and they have like hundreds of other locations worldwide as well. And it was incredible because we had this fantastic, beautifully designed office space to go to, to work. And we found ourselves like every day, just at nine o'clock in the morning, just going to WeWork because it was a way nicer experience working from the co-working space than it was just sitting at home working. These days, what me and everyone on my team has is the all access pass, which means you're not tied to a specific WeWork location, but it means you can use any of their several hundred co-working spaces around London, around the UK, and also around the world. And one of the things I really love about the co-working setup is that it's fantastic as a bit of a change of scenery. So these days I work from home, I've got the studio at home, but if I need to get some focused writing work done and I've been, I'm feeling a bit drained just sitting at my desk all day, I'll just pop over to the local WeWork, which is about a 10 minute walk from where I am. I'll take my laptop with me, I'll get some free coffee from there, I'll get a few snacks and it's just such a great vibe and you get to meet cool people. I made a few friends through meeting them at WeWork and it's just really nice being in an environment, almost like a library, but kind of nicer because there's like a little bit of soft music in the background and there's other kind of startup bros and creators and stuff in, in there as well. And it's just my absolute favorite co-working space of all time. It's super easy to book a desk or book a conference room using the app. And it's a great place to meet up with team members if you're gonna collaborate and you will live in different places. They've got unlimited tea and coffee and herbal teas and drinks on tap. And they've also got various kind of after work events that happen like happy hours and yoga and a few other exercise type things. And you can also take in guests. So often when guests will come over to visit, I'll say, hey, let's pop into WeWork and we'll just work from there for the whole day. And then we'll go out for dinner sometime in the evening. Anyway, if you're looking for a co-working space for you or your team, then I'd 100% recommend WeWork. Like I said, I've been a paying customer for theirs for the last two years, which is why it's particularly exciting that they're now sponsoring this episode. And if you want to get 50% off your first booking, then do head over to we.co forward slash Ali, and you can use the coupon code Ali at checkout ALI to get 50% off your first booking. So thank you so much, WeWork, for sponsoring this episode. It's so cool hearing about physical businesses. Um, I guess, you know, these days, Really, the only businesses you hear about, often the ones interviewed on podcasts, are like online and internet yeah. businesses like a oh, marketing agency or PR or digital media or content or courses or any of the software. But like physically designing a product, getting it manufactured and selling it to a physical customer, that's got to feel pretty good because yeah. you do the online stuff as well. What's the, yeah. what's, is, is there a difference, a different kind of enjoyment in, in the two? Uh, from online sales, there's very little enjoyment, unfortunately. I, I don't really like online sales, although they're a big part of our business. Um, there's no emotional attachment to an online sale apart from seeing the figures at the yeah. end of the day, which, are, oh, that's great. That makes me feel good. Um, uh, that's it. Yeah. Um, but what is nice is when you sell all this stuff and you don't see these customers and I go and visit different flying clubs or whatever it happens to be, or I'm racing model airplanes, which I'm doing this weekend as well. And you go to this club and half the models at this club are, are the models you designed. And you go, wow, look at that. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that came from my pen and I must've come through me at some stage. And that's pretty, pretty powerful stuff really. Hmm. Nice. With, uh, I've, I've just got a few specific questions about the shop shop stuff because it's weird for me. Um, do you have to like buy stock in bulk in advance and then s stick it in a warehouse and then you're hoping to sell it over time? Is, is that how it works? Um, it can be. It depends yeah. how you do it. I okay. mean, we ship from China 40-foot containers. Um, and if you look at model aeroplanes, again, going back to the one we just spoke about, you can get... Uh, 550 of those in one 40 foot container so obviously you're you're having to get containers on a let's say a monthly basis um, so on that side of the business yes you've got to buy in bulk because we're supplying not only end users we're supplying other model shops as well around mm -hmm. the country um, we also license the product to um, or used to to a guy in Germany who isn't there any longer but also to a guy in America so they they actually have the manufactured at source under our license and they go out um so yeah you do have to buy in bulk on that side of the business on the other side of the business the shop business really 
yes, you used to have to buy in more bulk, but because now it's a more competitive market, you probably don't have to do that now. Um, and also your website can show warehouse stock potentially that you don't have we mm. try not to do that route we try to have everything we show on our websites in stock at least a single item mm. because you know you get an order for it you want to fulfill it straight away yeah. um so the only company we deal with uh where we have to buy it well in advance and to the maximum we think we're going to sell is actually hornby hobbies okay because they're very very I'll put this on record, very backwards in the way they do business. Yeah. You know, they want to know exactly what they're going to sell for the year. They want those orders in advance so they can manufacture it, yeah. which I, I think is the wrong way to go about things. When when we first moved to the UK, it, I was eight years old and we were living in uh, Wiltshire, a little town called Devizes. And there was a toy shop there. Yeah. And I used to go there and buy these like uh, mini airplane things. Uh, yeah. the, with, and like, you know, they, they would have the whole thingy of like the Revel paints and the glues yeah, and stuff. Yeah, all the plastic and kits. I would get things. like a £7.99 one for my birthday. And then I spent ages like painting the bits. And then I realized Shit, you could paint them before you put the thing on and it makes yeah. it way easier. And that was like my hobby when I was a kid. And my brother and I went back a couple of years ago. And the same, same shop was there, the same kind of stuff. Um, we bought ourselves some Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh cards just for old time's sake. Um, but yeah, there was. Did the, you get Charizard in it? No, I wish. Oh, <laughs> if only. <there> if, <laughs> yeah, only. if only. If <laughs> only. Yeah, there was. There's just something so nice about um, just the the tactile nature of like a physical hobby, which I, I feel like I don't I don't really do anymore. But also yeah. the visit to the shop. Yeah, it's lovely, isn't it? Yeah, you can talk to them and be like, hey. The, how much enjoyment do you get from i'll have one of those i'll have one oh, of those zero less than zero <laughs> so yeah. that's the same for me selling you that product yeah you come into my shop as i explained before yeah. and you ask about something and i can give you years years yeah. of advice years of help you know that 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 will be perfect for you and you've had that experience of coming in and buying why have we decided that the internet's better mm. what a shame i think it's it's, it's the same kind of thing uh you know, if I make a video telling, teaching someone the step by step method to starting a YouTube channel, that's very different to sitting down in front of someone and saying the same stuff, but seeing the like, oh shit, in there. You can see thing. the light bulb yeah. come on, can't and you? You can see kind of the ideas whirring yeah. and stuff, which you just don't get over the internet. Um, but yeah, internet, <laughs> zero cost, <laughs> big scale. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> There's lots of, you know, pros and cons. So, so you've got this model business right now. What other businesses do you have? What else? What are the streams of revenue in your life, I guess? Uh, well, there's all sorts of streams of revenue. Obviously, investing is a stream of revenue, but everything I invest in gets reinvested anyway. Um, YouTube, obviously, is a revenue stream as mm. well, which is shared 50-50 with my son. Um, and obviously, there's a lot of cost to YouTube that people don't realize. I mean, all this equipment, it all costs money, doesn't it? And to do a professional setup, we reinvest a lot of money. I don't know what the percentages are, mm. but it's a lot of money. Um and that's a good revenue stream for me now. But it was never started for that reason. You know, it was started purely to pass on these years of knowledge. Yeah. And I say to a lot of people, to give 35 years worth of ex life experience, you've got to look about 55. Haven't you? <laughs> and that's just the way it is. Yeah. Um, so it wasn't done initially to, to be a revenue stream. Yeah. But of course, it certainly is now. Yeah. Nice. So kind of model business with the manufacturing arm and also the, the commerce arm. And then yeah. the YouTube thing, are sort of your main, I guess, active income. Yeah. And then investing and stuff on, exactly on the passive that, side. Yeah. Nice. Well, I'm a very keen reinvestor. So um, I don't really take much out from investing. The only time I really have is when I bought one of my warehouses because it was during the dot-com bubble and I took it out and bam, it went down and I did it a week really before the bubble burst. It was fantastic. Nice. So <laughs> you've got to have a little bit of luck along the yeah, way, haven't that's you? It. <laughs> um, changing gears a bit. What is your take on buying versus renting a house? Uh, I like to buy. I not only like to buy, I like to buy and pay off. Oh, interesting. Yes, I know. Well, I'm very um, I'm very uh, borrowing avert, although we spoke about borrowing earlier. Borrowing for a means, I understand. Um, the loan that started my business was paid back within two and a half, three years, and it was a 20-year loan. Mm -hmm. So a 20-year, 15-year loan. Um I like to pay back loans. I like to know what I've got. I like to know what's mine. Now, if I did it all again, I would be less loan, yeah, less um, avert to borrowing money hmm. and using money to make more money. 
So my advice on that or my tips would be don't be a uh, loan avert because money can make money. If you've got access to it, you can make money from it. But I would say on buying property, for me, your key property you live in, buy it, own it, get it paid for. It can't be taken away from you. You've got such security for you, your family and your wife for the rest of your life. That That's, that's my take. Yeah. You know, on... Res- a residential property I buy to rent out or commercial property I buy to rent out. Obviously, I'll borrow and I'll let that run the term, sure. although most of my commercial property is paid off now. Oh, nice. But That's you cool. get to a certain stage in life. I mean, again, we mentioned yeah. 55, which is <laughs> what I am. <laughs> yeah. Then you want to be secure. Yep. You know, you all these things. With. As you gradually secure things off, you feel safer with the future and how things are going to go. Um, so although I'm not avert to borrowing some money for a good project, um, I would always endeavour to try and get that paid off for me as quickly as I can. My son is the opposite. But then he's 24 and has a lot of time to go over those stages of paying down. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, What are the... So you guys have a ridiculously enormous following across all of the social medias, which is mm. fantastic. You've done a fantastic job over the last you know, just only Big shout two out to years. My team as yeah. well, hey? Last t- two and a bit years of doing the YouTube stuff. Um, What are the main... What are the main questions that you get from from your audience around finance? Uh, probably what should I invest in to yeah. make me rich tomorrow? Almost, <laughs> you know. Okay. Um, and it doesn't matter how much um, we preach or, or put over long-term investing is long-term wealth. It's it's very hard to get that message over. And I, I think with the instant access of everything to youngsters nowadays, it probably is hard to understand that, you know, you've got these small amounts to gain a big amount in the future. Mm. So, I always bang on about index funds. We've already mentioned it before. If you've not got an index fund running in an ISA, why haven't you? You know, it is, it's is—it's yeah. one of the simplest <laughs> things that you can do as an individual, the most tax efficient thing you can do as an individual. You are going to be a millionaire if you put an amount of a decent coffee away every day into your index fund, sorted. Hmm. You know, and that's your safety net. And now, again, a lot of people say you shouldn't have a safety net. You should be 100% in on what you're doing. But that's always been my safety net. I always thought from the day I started putting into an index fund, I would never, ever touch that money. Now, I'm at a stage where I could touch it if I wanted to. I can touch my pensions if I wanted to. I don't need to. I have other uh, revenue streams bringing the money in. It is just there just in case. It's almost a, a reminder that you made that money. You can make it again. You don't need to touch it. Why do I need to touch it? Yeah. Yeah, I've been preaching the ISA index fund strategy to my friends in years. Um, I mean, it's so <laughs> obvious, isn't it? So because obvious, yeah. if it wasn't so good, it wouldn't be limited to 20 grand a year, would yeah. it? It would be a open pot to yep. put as much as you wanted in. So it's just obvious. You know, you just got to get on board and take the small losses when they come. Keep putting in. Don't worry about it. Forget about it. It's working in the distance. I mean, you don't come out of your house. If you own a house, you don't come out of your house house every day and go, oh, it's gone down 5% today. Yeah. Of course you don't because it's still there, isn't it? You're not selling it. You're living in it. You you don't worry about that sort of thing as you shouldn't worry about your index funds. Mm. Just keep putting in. Historically, they've raised 8% a year. Mm. Yeah, you can't go wrong with that. Yeah. And if anyone needs a primer on index funds, we'll put some of my videos and your videos in the video description and show notes so you can mm. you can get a get a primer on them. Um any advice for people who are who don't have large amounts of disposable income who think, "Oh, I'd love to start investing, but I'll do it. I don't have enough money right now." Make more money. You can only save so much money. I was expecting you to talk about tips for budgeting and stuff, but this is interesting. Like, what do no, you mean? Yeah. Make more money. <laughs> you, you, know, you can save so much. Say you get paid £1,000 a month for argument's sake. Okay. If you saved every penny of that, that's £1,000. Wow. That's all you can do. There's no limit to how much you can make. So make more money. You know, you've got to budget. Of course you've got to budget. If you don't budget, you don't know where it's gone. Mm. So 100% budget, but make more money. How do it's you, not hard. How do you do that? Like so someone might be listening well, to this saying, well... Okay, people like going yeah. to a bar, yeah? yeah? They like going to a pub. Well, go to the pub, but be the other side of the bar. Get yourself a part-time job. You've got all the social side of going to the bar and being in a pub, and you're getting paid for it. Yeah. 
You know, that's just one example. There's hundreds of examples. You know, it's you know, just make more money. It sounds so simple. It is, isn't it, though, if you think about it? I, 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 I mean, can, if someone yeah. said to you, right, it, you need to invest £5 a day into an index fund mm. and, you, and, so, and you turn around and go, oh, I, I don't have £5 left. In the whole of your day, taking out your day of work, you can earn £5 somewhere doing something. Of course you could. It could be washing dishes in a restaurant. It could be anything, couldn't it? But you could earn an extra five pounds. Don't spend it. Put it in an index fund. I can imagine someone listening to this. I mean, f- for the record, I agree with your advice. I, 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 I can imagine someone listening to this being like, fuck you guys. You guys are privileged and rich and like you don't realize that I've got a family to feed and like I'm already working two jobs just to pay my rent because rent's gone up because inflation and stuff. How can you possibly tell me to? I just need to earn more money? Because they're working so hard, so hard because they're servicing the debt that they're under, generally speaking. So again, if we're into that scenario, start earning more, start paying those debts down, particularly the high debts. I mean, they're crippling, aren't they? You know, again, if you're earning that thousand pound a year, uh, sorry, a month, for argument's sake, it's an easy figure to use, yeah. and two hundred of that is going on interest and payments, and you're not getting anywhere. Well, you're actually living on eight hundred pounds. So yeah. get it, get it paid down. I know That's, it's harsh. Yeah, it is harsh, but it's also quite simple as well, isn't it? So let's say, okay, so let's say someone's listening to this. They're like, "Cool, I'm earning a thousand pounds a month right now." What would you recommend as like your pro like if you were in that position how would you go about earning an extra let's say 100 quid a month or an extra 500 quid a month well it's probably a bit different for me and it's different for everyone isn't it but i would use that scenario i just said if you like going to the pub work in the pub yeah if you like what whatever you like to do find some some requirement from it like i was flying model airplanes or flying model helicopters there was an element of of desire that i could pass on that skill so that skills worth something mm. you know go online you know there's l- lots of things you can do online like copywriting for example or whatever it happens to be in fact yeah. you don't even have to do it just ask ai <laughs> to do it for you and send it on you know there are so many things that you can just earn that small amount extra and as long as you don't go and spend it or waste it your your quid's in yeah nice Okay, so one big question that you get is, how do I start investing to make money to, to, to get rich tomorrow? What are the kind of questions do you guys get that you find yourself answering quite often? Um, that's quite a hard one. I'm looking at Curtis there <laughs> for uh, a thing. I mean, mo- most things, most of the things we get are quite positive, and I think you're in a similar situation. It's more of a, I didn't realize that, I'll have a go at that. Um, I, I think the, the, the thing that we get that we can't really get over is the time you know everyone who's young has got time to make money you know i don't think people are aware of how much time they have but they've got to start you can't keep asking for advice and not taking action all right because where's it going to get you 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 can read a hundred books but if you don't take action what's the point in reading all those books no point you know so action is the thing isn't it you know, the, the answer to most people's questions is take action, do something, have a go. Nice. Uh, what's, your, uh, what's your take on the whole stop buying lattes from Starbucks so that you can put your £3.50 in an index fund debate? <laughs> well, it's not, it's not really that, is it? Yeah. That's <laughs> not really the thing. You know, the smashed avocado on toast, it's not really the thing. It's where you're going to find that money from. And obviously by saying don't buy the coffee, don't buy the avocado, it, it, that's all on the, the saver mentality, isn't it? It's like to, to save some of the money you earn. Well, all those things bring enjoyment, don't they? I mean, going out for a nice coffee, taking the wife out or the girlfriend or whatever, yeah, they're all nice things. So... I'll go back to what I said before. Put some money on top of what you're earning and use that. That's money you didn't have. Any money you earn on top of what you earn is free. Well, it's not free money, but you can think of it as free money. Use that to invest rather than say, I've got to physically give up my coffee. But having said that, do you need a Starbucks coffee on your way to work? Probably not. You make an instant coffee, pop it in a cup, stick it in the car. You'll enjoy it probably just as much. 
You know, I, I buy a particular instant coffee I quite like, and everyone goes, instant? Mm. But I quite like that. So yeah. I'll make a coffee. When I go to work at the shop, I'll make a coffee. I'll take it with me. I could stop. I've got a Costa drive through on the way to work. Well, you know, it might sound tight coming from me, but that's four quid. I don't need to spend that. And the chances are if you stop for that, you can have a pastry as well, and you've seen what they charge for those. <laughs> so, you know, you don't have to do these things. And actually, what are you giving up? Yeah. You've still got your hot drink you enjoy. Yeah. Uh, have you come across a book called Die With Zero? No, but I'm guessing what it's about. <laughs> yeah. So interesting book by Bill, Bill Perkins, basically about how people who are kind of aimed at, I guess, entrepreneurs uh, and people who invest a lot in, into their careers, where the mindset of make more money, save more money, continues way beyond it's actually useful and actually his his whole premise in the book is that provided you've given given what you want to your kids and given what you want to charities you should aim to die with zero dollars in the bank account and a lot of people when they hit retirement age they find that a their health is already declined and so shit they should have spent more money when they were younger to do interesting things and b that the mindset of scrounging and saving pennies no longer like that that then holds them back and they end and they end up dying with loads of money left in the bank account which is time which is money that they could have not worked for and therefore saved time assuming they didn't enjoy their jobs or it was a backpacking trip they could have taken in their mm. 20s or 30s or whatever that mm. thing might have been how do you how do you think about that balance well it's multifaceted that isn't it really because first of all you've got to say do you enjoy what you do mm. now i enjoy what i do for a living the the youtube side of things and the social media with my son i i absolutely love yeah. um so first of all why would i stop doing that if that's something i really enjoy um so far this year we've been to las vegas um we we've come and met you today um i'm doing a bungee jump shortly because one of our guests gave us a bungee jump experience nice. <laughs> um i'm going to dubai next month i'm doing a parachute jump over the palm island or that's the plan um we're skiing i, I don't know if i just mentioned yeah. that um I, I love doing lots of experiences yeah. I, I would say if you're an entrepreneur or a businessman the model I've always tried to do is to spend a little bit more each year, try and improve your life and your experiences every year. Mm. And what I believe is when you pass away, the experiences and the fun you had are the things that you're left with. Mm. So I've always done experiences, always wanted to race cars. I've done that. The box is ticked. Yeah. You know, all these different things are, are great experiences and you should experience them without a doubt. But dying with zero... I don't like the idea of that. I like the idea of generational wealth. And I like the idea that my granddad said to my dad, you're going to do better than me, you know, carry the family name forward and all the rest of it. He said the same to me. I've said the same to my son as yeah. well. You know, I think that generational thing is great. And particularly when you come from humble beginnings, if you can build your family wealth up, that's got to be a good thing, mm. you know. Nice. How How do you think about, like, charity and like donating and that kind of stuff. I like to think that I give for the right reasons, but I think we all give for the reasons that we can say we gave. Yep. <laughs> um, uh, I think Ricky Gervais did a really good sketch on it in, um, what was it, Extras, where he went past him, oh, I've only got, only got a tenner. Don't, don't really want to give a tenner, but oh, there, there, oh, there's a tenner. You got any, right, yeah, have the tenner, you know, and it was all for show, wasn't it? Yeah. And, I think there's a lot of that goes on. Um, I give where I want to give, and I'm happy to give where I give. I don't probably give enough at the moment, but probably will more so in the future. Okay, nice. If I see it being used well yeah. as well, you know, that's quite important to me. I mean, our charity as a business is Kent Air Ambulance, so we'll give to that mm. um, because I think that's a very good cause. And maybe there's a bit of me that thinks, well, I might need that one day. Mm. So bit of payback yeah. <laughs> i don't know yeah there's obviously all these things in there why do people give to cancer organizations yeah. might need what they develop you know mm. it, it's it's a funny thing isn't yeah. it yeah yeah um a lot of entrepreneurs they sort of when you ask them especially i think above the age of like 30 they kind of wish they'd spent more time either on their health and or their relationships as they were as they were making it big, as it were. 
Um, do you have any of those regrets? Um, the only regret I have is I wish I could have spent more time with my son. <laughs> He's giving me the eye now because he knows where I'm going with that. <laughs> yeah. um, the re- that, and that's probably why now is such a good time. Yeah. You know, it's he's 24 where he's a man, you know, and we, we get on well and we work hard to, to achieve the goals we want to achieve. Um, but it is a very hard balance, very hard balance. I mean, the, the thing he, if you asked him, the thing that I didn't spend enough time on was he was a very good swimmer and I wouldn't have gone to enough swimming events to watch him. My flip side of that was always that they wouldn't give you the time that his race was on. And I wasn't interested in watching anyone else swim or getting hot in the environment of a swimming pool. It's not just hot, it's humid, it's horrible. And it's so loud with everyone screaming, their kids coming on and all the rest of it. Um, So if they could have given me a time, then I could have gone, right, I'll lock that in, I'll be there, I'll be watching that, cheering him on, saying well done at the end and all the rest of it. Um, So that's a slight regret slight regret but realistically if you work hard you can gain the benefits along the way and if your life gets a bit better over a year then i think everyone enjoys that Hmm. nice do you think that um again so when i speak to a lot of entrepreneurs and you haven't alluded to this yet which is Mm -hmm. which is interesting but when i speak to a lot of entrepreneurs they talk about the importance of work-life balance um but they only talk about that once they're already millionaires. Yeah. Um, to what extent, like I, we, we we talked about when you were younger and you know in your in your teens, but to what extent do you think for let's say entrepreneurs like your son, for example, uh, or someone like me, and you know, I'm 28, um, or people in their 30s, how much how how important is this idea of work life balance? Do you reckon? Um, I think the honesty is, as we alluded to earlier, is the important part of that. So as long as the your partner, and I know you have a fairly new girlfriend um i think the honesty behind how much work you need to do and how much time that takes up that's important because at the end of the day yes it's a relationship but it's also a bit of a contract as well isn't it if if she's expecting more from you than you're able to provide and vice versa then that's a problem that's where the problem is going to create so i think open and honest is is very important um we used to operate um, the shops initially seven days a week. You know, that, that's a lot of time when you're on very low staff and you're having to be there. Um, so I, I think work-life balance is very important. But if you, if you start off honestly and then every year it gets better, then I don't think that's a, necessarily a problem. Um, I'm probably going to shock you here with something as Ooh, well. Hello. Um, when my wife went into labour to have my son, um, I was out teaching someone to fly a model helicopter at the time. I said, oh, yeah, I'll be, I'll be there. I'll be about 20 minutes, half an hour. So that was bad, really, because I should have been straight there. Um, two days after he was born, I was in America competing in a radar-controlled model helicopter competition, which, again, would sound bad to the average person. But that's the commitment I had to the hobby and to the industry that I was in, mm. that I had to do that. So yeah, it doesn't sound right, but that is how it is. Yeah, and your wife was okay with this. Well, to be fair, she was probably happy I wasn't around <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for those two weeks anyway. So nice. Um, what's it like running a business with your son? Um, it can be quite argumentative, um, but ultimately fulfilling. Hmm. Um, we used to, our podcast now is called Strike It Big. It used to be called Like Father, Like Son. Mm. The reason we named it Like Father, Like Son was because we thought the arguments that we had and the disagreements we had and the differences between the old and the new, that would make great viewing. Uh, We ended up finding that the arguments we had weren't really the ones that we'd want to air anyway because they were probably irrelevant or when you look back on them a day later, it's sort of like, well, it didn't really matter, did it, whether that was orange or red. Mm -hmm. You know, it didn't matter, but we had an argument about it. Um, But ultimately, working with your son is very rewarding and that would never have happened within the industry that I'm in because he has no interest in radar control models. So... um, it was a case of we would never work together, but now we do, and that's good. Nice, because because a lot of people would say, oh, you know, whatever you do, don't go into business with any family members. Yeah, do you? I guess you don't agree with that advice. Um, not right. really. No, I. You've got to be quite strong, I think, because it it could have fallen apart. Yeah, 
but it didn't fall apart. And it's like a relationship with a girlfriend stroke wife. You know, it's never happy. So it's never like that. Great, 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 yeah. great. It's a roller coaster. Yeah. And there are ups and downs. Yeah. And as, you, as long as you know, ultimately, that we're, we're, we're both working for the business, for the betterment of the business. And when I suggest something that's outright ludicrous or God, you're thinking from the Stone Age, Dad, you know, it's, it's meant with the right passion, yeah. you know, to get the business forward. And, you know, a couple of days later, you might come back and say, yeah, there is something in that. And there's an app that does that now in a better way and we can work with this and, oh, yeah, that works. And then that's great. Another time, maybe that was absolute awful yeah. suggestion. But I'm okay with it as long as it's taken on board and it's like, yeah, we'll give it some thought. Nice. And then that, that's good. Fantastic. Um, oh, I just had a question. But it is a roller coaster. <laughs> yeah. What do you see as the end game for you with the, I guess, the the content side of the business? Um, that, that's hard to say, really. I mean, the thing I get from it, you know, equally as as I do from working with my son, is the the good comments back. Yeah. You know. When you get comments back that you've changed people's lives, that's great. When people work, walk up to you, and I'm sure you've had this, it's like, you know, I saw that video with you and talking about this mm. fund or talking about this idea or this side hustle, and I've done it and I'm doing really well. That's brilliant. You know, I, I don't really want that to stop. I'd like that to continue forever. Yeah. Because that's fantastic, isn't it? If you can bring everyone up rather than push everyone down, you're going to feel better as a person, aren't you? Yeah. And that's what I like. You know, all you know, ninety nine point nine percent of our comments are, are positive of people that have done better through what they've done, hadn't realised what they could do or yeah. what they were capable of. I mean, how many people don't realise what they're capable of? Most, you know, it's it's amazing. Nice. So internet fame has broadly been a positive thing for you guys? I think so. Yeah, yeah. we were we were in a tube station last night, and that was quite funny. Cause oh, yeah, we what happened? Were, oh, just recognize, you know, people chat. Sometimes they don't want to come up to you, do yeah. they? You can hear what you they're saying. Like, they go, oh, yeah, that's the guy I learned such and such off <laughs> yeah. of. And you can hear them discussing it. Yeah. And you can think, oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Not only has he learned it, he's telling them that that's the guy, mm. and now they're learning it. And that's superb. Yeah, it's a really nice feeling to be able to pass on knowledge and experience and my, stuff. My, my mentor um dave this isn't the guy we spoke about mm. earlier this is another guy he died about or oh, 20 years ago now he passed on his knowledge for free absolutely for free mm. didn't even know he was passing on the knowledge didn't know maybe he had an inkling i was absorbing it mm. i don't know but that was for free that's why we do all our content for free one thing i'm curious about so I'm going to phrase this in a, in a, in a weird way, but <laughs> like from, from from what you've experienced and what you've seen, what are the different levels of wealth? By 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 which I mean, you know, there's clearly a big difference between like 10k a month and like 50k a month in terms of what it affords your lifestyle. But like 50 to 100, 100 to 250, 250, like what what are the levels with which you see or in in your in, in your friends like step changes in though this thing actually improves your life? Well, I think it's widely accepted about 80K buys you just about yeah. most things you want. And you can go wherever you want. You can do pretty much whatever you want mm. over a certain amount of time. You can do all those things. So if you want to go to Cuba, for example, you can fly economy mm. to Cuba, have a week in an okay hotel and all the rest of it. So I, I think the first key for most people is to get to that sort of level of wealth. Mm. Um, beyond that, it does several things. It enables you to go in first class if you want to, or premium even. You know, there's a, a plus to that, isn't there? You know, it's diminishing returns, but the comfort is so much better. Like for myself, when I first travelled to China and I was doing my business there, I was travelling economy. Now I would never go less than premium because I know that if I go a better service, I can work that next day that I arrive. Well, when I was travelling economy, I couldn't do that. You know, I'm all like this and being a larger sort of chap it, it's very difficult so as you become better off it affords you just those better ways of doing things the better hotel the, the better travel the you know some might say the better experiences 
you know, really, because, you know, rather than sitting on the beach watching that guy paraglide along behind the boat, that's you mm. paragliding behind the boat. Obviously, it is a diminishing return, but you can also buy back a bit of your time as well. And I think as you become wealthier, that that's the thing that you're buying back, you know, because you can get other people to do other jobs for you, yeah. other things that you'd be tied up doing. Anything that takes your time away, if you can buy that time back, then yeah. that's a great thing, isn't it? And we're all on a limited time scale here, all of us, and it's too short. You know, we all think we're going to live to 100, but the facts are we're not. I don't know what the facts are. It's probably 86, <laughs> 80 something, is yeah. it? Something yeah. like that. It's not a lot of life, is yeah. it, really? And you've got a lot of things to fit in. You know, I had an accident not so long ago. Uh, you may have seen the video. Um, and that that's it wasn't a life-threatening. Well, it could have been life-threatening. It was a punctured lung and a yeah. ribs gone on the back and all the rest of it. It was pretty shocking. Um but as I laid there and I looked at my wife and my son, I thought, you know, hopefully it's not the last time I see them. But if it is, they won't be able to write on their, I wish you'd done more, because he's had a pretty fulfilled life up to this stage. And I think that's quite a nice way to be. I mean, I, I also believe, you know, I, I don't like live every day like it's the last because otherwise you'd end up with no money, doing all sorts of things you shouldn't be doing. But I think you should live this life like it's your last life. Because it is, you know, so enjoy everything as you go. We have one guy who works for me. He said, you should spend more money. You should do more things. You should do this. You should do that. And I said, but I'm having a great time. I'm 55 years old. And I can't remember a year I didn't enjoy. Mm. So there's nothing wrong with that, is there? Yeah. I take enjoyment from all sorts of things. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it seems like it. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's a bit of a debate well it's, it's not much of a debate but uh, I'd, I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on these two two scenarios number one i don't like doing the laundry i don't like doing the cleaning of my house therefore i'm going to outsource it because my time is worth 50 quid an hour i can outsource it for 20 quid an hour 100%, versus 100 percent agree with that versus it builds character and it's good for you to clean your own dishes and wash your own clothes stop being a twat like do it yourself <laughs> kind when of thing. you couldn't afford it you did it yourself yeah you understood what you needed to do and when that person phones you up and say they can't come in you know how to do it it's all about understanding those those jobs once you can afford to buy your time back 100 percent, that's what you should be doing I, I i think that you know wholeheartedly um but doing the jobs i think is quite important as well if you have the money as a birthright and it's gifted to you and you never ever do any of those jobs and i think you've lost something there without a doubt and within my business um, or businesses, there's not one job I haven't done and also use my carpentry skills in there as well. You know, so yeah. everything, yeah, everything I can do, I've done. And then when I ask someone to do a job, I'm not asking them to do a job of from a position of, I don't want to do that. Yeah. I hate that job. You can do it. I'm doing it saying, well, I have done it. You know, I've done my time. It's now your time to go through that. And yep. that's how it is. Nice. Um, couple and more also questions. you're yeah. making employment as well yeah absolutely. I mean for someone who does your laundry or does your ironing that's another little side hustle isn't it you know it's something rather than sat there watching Emmerdale Farm or Coronation Street which if they enjoy it and they get enjoyment from nothing wrong with that but they could be stood in front of an ironing board doing your ironing and earning 20, 30, yeah. 40 quid an hour. And they can watch Coronation Street while doing that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Perfect scenario. Absolutely. And then they can invest it in an index fund. That's the one. Um, we'll put links to Vanguard and stuff down below. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what, what are some things where you found that spending more money has actually led to more fulfillment? A lot of people say like business class is way better than economy. So if you can afford it, it's totally worth it. Are there any other things where... Well, first class, I wouldn't say it's necessarily better than um, than premium, to yeah. be perfectly honest. So we flew uh, first class back from the States because Virgin offered a, a deal that we yeah. couldn't say no to. You probably had similar deals. Um, so we said, yeah, okay, we'll do it. Um, but the life lap beds for me being six foot four and a half, six foot five, yeah. it, <laughs> it, it, it was no benefit because yeah. I was still cramped up. But in a, in a premium seat, I can sleep no problem at all. Mm. Um, sorry, I wonder where we're going there. So buying. Oh, um, what are what are some areas in which you found that spending more money has actually led to a better experience or more happiness? Or 
I think being able to going back to the airline thing it yeah. is is being able to up, you know. But you don't have to go the full hog, you know. I I, I spoke with Graham Stephan recently, who most of your viewers will recognise that mm-hmm. name, and he he is more frugal than I am. He's ridiculously frugal. Yeah, yeah. I'm always surprised whenever. I yeah, see he that. said because um, we said about. Um, traveling first class and premium this and the other and he said i always travel economy i said really you know you're worth 20 million dollars why would you travel that way he said well the only time i've traveled um upper class is when it costs me less than 30 dollars an hour to trap more to travel first class he said that's what i i value that first class at Okay. So that's the way he looks at things. Yeah. I think that's too far. I think, you know, you can't get, there is a diminishing return. Obviously, we know that. But if you arrive in comfort, that's got to be worthwhile. And also, I'm sure you've been in the Virgin Lounge at Heathrow. What that, you know, that brings back the, the jet set way of traveling. You know, you go into that lounge, you're fully relaxed, you feel like you want to get on the flight, you stay in the normal area, you're fighting to get something to eat, your drink's being knocked over by someone, there's everyone screaming, all the noise. So it does afford you certain benefits that's for sure so spending a bit of money is a good thing (laughs) and rewarding yourself as well you know at the end of the day having a reward keeps you positive and focused on what you're doing you know so again talking of rewards my son bought um, a rolex because we got a million subscribers that was the target if we ever got to that he would buy that he did and he rewarded himself and i think if you're building rewards to your to your uh, business then that's a good thing Cool. Final question. Um, what was it like interviewing and meeting Andrew Tate? <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. He was, um, he was, you know, some people find this hard to believe, but he was a perfect gentleman. Um, he arrived early. He gave willingly of his time, as much time as we wanted. We thought we were overrunning and we stopped because we'd filled a, a, a card up on the camera and uh, we said oh we filled a camera. you know he's going to want to go and he said oh that's fine yeah time to get another coffee and uh, if you want any more oh yeah so we went for another hour on top of what we thought he would allow us um some of his thoughts and ideas of course are not you know great with everyone i understand that and some of them aren't great with me we did a reaction video to it and I would say 80% roughly is what we'd agree with. Mm. 20% isn't. Um, talking of hate comments, because this brings some up, that of course we had some from that. Um, and people, the, the, the biggest comment we had is, why are you talking to this guy? And we get that quite often when we interview people, you know, from time to time, you know, this is not what we expect from you. And the reply is always that we interview interesting people because they're interesting not because we agree with them 100 percent. and if we only interviewed people we agree with 100 percent. guess what we'd have no guests Mm. you know you take what you can from an interview as a as a viewer learn what you can discard what you don't want you know throw it in the trash it doesn't matter but take what you can learn what you can and that's how you move on you can't be black or white, totally yeah. polarised. I hate that guy, so nothing he says is going to be of benefit to me. Or the opposite, everything he says is gospel. It's, it's what I believe, 100%, whatever he says. Yeah. You can't be like that. And I think it's a shame when people are because then they don't have their own opinions. Yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah, I'm with, I'm with you on this one. I think I mean it's I, the people yeah. that you meet that form your opinion surely. Yeah. You know that's that's what it's all about. They're the only ones that can change the way you think. Mm. The things you understand. Yeah, we 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 had a bit of a debate amongst our amongst our team about this sort of stuff like what sort of guests do we want to give a platform to? Mm. And there was a lot of back and forth and I really appreciate everyone who kind of shared shared their opinion on this. But my view was that if I could get an interview with Vladimir Putin, I would be like, hell yes. I wouldn't be like, oh, this is the sort of person who's so evil that they cannot be spoken to. Yeah. Uh, and if you can, if I'd, if you would interview someone extreme like that, then the, you know, basically reason to have a conversation with basically anyone yeah. and figure out what you can learn from them. Because everyone, everyone, regardless of how we think of them, has an interesting perspective to share. I think so. You know, if J.K. Rowling wanted to be on the podcast, of course, we talk about her writing. Probably wouldn't talk about her trans views, but we talk about the writing. It's like mm. you, you can learn something from everyone regardless of what you think about the 
totality of their opinions. But then some people would say that, like, well, you're giving a platform to someone that is, is spreading their messages of hate even more. How do you how do you, how do you feel about the whole platforming thing? Um, or what being deplatformed, as, or, or, or as, giving them as a in platform. giving like f f freedom of speech does not necessarily mean the right to a platform. So by having a big platform and bringing on someone like an Andrew Tate or whoever evil person is currently evil in you know in the in the media, then you're allowing their message to spread more than it would otherwise. Well, what's your opinion on Andrew Tate? As this is what this actually is referring to. My opinion is broadly similar to yours. I think 80% very reasonable, 20% uh, uh, I disagree with significantly. Hmm. I think the the way in which he phrases a lot of things rubs a lot of people up the wrong way yeah. and he knows it does and that's kind of the whole model. My first yeah. question to him was, do you believe 100% in what you say hmm. and do or are you just poking the bear? His answer was, well, I'm poking the bear. Hmm. I'm getting a reaction. <laughs> so... That was the first question we posed, and yeah. he answered that honestly. Yeah. Um, obviously, he believes in some of the, the 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 women stuff he believes in, and that's what we kicked back on. We pushed back on it on the actual interview, mm. and we pushed back on it even more on the you know the the follow up video we did. Um, so you know you're going to learn something from everyone. Mm. I, I I think it's wrong necessarily to deplatform someone, um, and I don't. Are we giving him a platform? I think we're giving people a chance to um, listen to a good debate and a good conversation. Yeah, yeah, I'm, and we're in control of the edit. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, so yeah. although I, I'll be absolutely honest yeah. with you, ten minutes edited out of that one. Yeah, just for flow, really, not for. Yeah, so nice. about ten minutes for flow. So that was a pretty everything video. Nice. In fact, it's the least edited podcast I think we've probably ever done. Hmm. So that shows it was very genuine, doesn't it? Yeah. And he did find a platform anyway. Mm. Yeah, he will. He's on Rumble, isn't he? Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. He, all his fans will find him, no problem at all. So yeah. um, I think it showed. Um, I think it showed pretty much the true side of him, which I'm quite proud of, to be honest. And it was the last interview with Andrew Tate before he was uh, yeah. arrested. Yeah. And the charges keep changing, don't they? So Seems like uh, <laughs> you do wonder if he's being pinned with something he hasn't done. Who knows? I mean, anyone who's had the background he's had probably has a skeleton in their closet. Probably. Mm. So it's very difficult, isn't it? Yeah. Very difficult. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm with you on this one. I think I can see why people would say don't give someone a platform, mm. but I think the net value to the world of exposing people to opinions that they don't like mm. with appropriate degrees of preparation yeah. and ultimately freedom in the final cut, <laughs> yeah. I think is always a reason to have the conversation. Mm. I mean, we obviously did clash on the, the, the woman side of things yeah. because I personally believe finding the right partner, be it male, female, whoever mm. you are, that is one of the most important things in your life. That will make you a stronger person. Mm. Not having multiple women, all that does is spread your time out, waste your time, find the right person, have a full loving relationship. And that's what I've had. And that's what I'll continue to have. Fantastic. Mark, I think that's a good place to end this. Thank you so much for taking the time. Where can people learn more about you and, and the work that you do? Uh, they can come and see us on YouTube. Uh, just type in Mark Tilbury. I'll come up. Uh, or watch the Strike It Big podcast, where I think you'll be appearing very soon. Exactly. <laughs> We're going to do that interview now. Thank you so much. And have a great More day. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Pleased to meet you. Likewise. <laughs> All right, so that's it for this week's episode of Deep Dive. Thank you so much for watching or listening. All the links and resources that we mentioned in the podcast are going to be linked down in the video description or in the show notes, depending on where you're watching or listening to this. If you're listening to this on a podcast platform, then do please leave us a review on the iTunes store. It really helps other people discover the podcast. Or if you're watching this in full HD or 4K on YouTube, then you can leave a comment down below and ask any questions or any insights or any thoughts about the episode. That would be awesome. And if you enjoyed this episode, you might like to check out this episode here as well, which links in with some of the stuff that we talked about in the episode. So thanks for watching. Uh, do hit the subscribe button if you aren't already, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.